thank you for joining us for this, which is our first Asia Real Estate Summit webinar series, which will address the significant market challenges, as well as the opportunities created by the unprecedented impact that COVID-19 is having on the real estate industry here in Asia and also around the globe. I'm your host today, Jules Kay, MD of Property Guru Asia Property Awards and Events. And I'm joined by Mr. David Johnson of Delivering Asia Communications, who will be managing our Q&A live session later. Hi, David. Jules. Morning. Afternoon. Wherever you are, yes. You must be in the afternoon realms. Okay. Um, the Real Estate Summit uh, is an annual thought leadership event. It brings together property professionals every year to discuss industry innovations, share ideas, propose practical solutions to key industry challenges. This year's summit will take place in December, right here in Bangkok, Thailand. But while many of the property markets are actually in lockdown and going through a period of uncertainty, we thought it'd be a good idea to invite some experts and leaders from a wide range of real estate sectors and international markets to share their insights right here online. Today's webinar will focus mainly on strategies for investors and developers to consider as they prepare for the COVID-19 property market after things begin to flatten. Our speakers today bring decades of experience, knowledge and resilience to your screen. So let me start by introducing them individually before we move on to the presentations. So, Mr. Jeremy Williams, make yourself known. <laughs> Jeremy Williams is the Chief Business Officer of Property Guru, Southeast Asia's most trusted property technology company with leading real estate portals across five countries that draw over 23 million property seekers monthly. Thank you for joining us today, Jeremy. Thank you, Jules. Mr. John Hitchcock is founder of You Worldwide, one of the world's largest residential design and development brands with more than 50 projects completed and 30 plus projects under development around the world. It's a privilege to have you with us from the UK today, John. Mr. Lloyd Lee is managing partner of U Capital, a privately held real estate investment firm with over $2 billion of assets under management and commitments from institutional investors across six continents. Many thanks for giving us your time, Lloyd. You hearing us, Lloyd? Very fine. Good, good. Mr. Paul Ashburn, co-managing partner of BDO Thailand, which is part of a $9.6 billion global auditing and financial advisory firm with offices across 167 countries, including all 10 ASEAN markets. Warm welcome to you too, Paul. Afternoon, Jules. Nice to see you. And Mr. Bill Barnett, Managing Director of C9 Hotel Works, an innovative market-leading hospitality and real estate <laughs> consultancy with projects all over Asia, which also produces in-depth market research and investment reports that have become essential reading for many of the businesses and leaders in this region. Delighted to have you with us too, Bill. Okay. Mask on or mask off? Up to you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> You're social distancing here. We're all online, don't we? <laughs> So now, before we discuss our core themes and take questions from the participants today, which are coming from multiple countries, I might add, um, all over the world joining us today, some 700 people. Thank you all for joining us again. We will begin with a, a few short presentations on uh, the challenges, the solutions, and the opportunities that our speakers see right now and in the months ahead, given the impact of COVID-19. So without further ado, first let's hear from Jeremy Williams at Property Guru Group on changes in real estate consumer behavior, as well as developers' responses and how both of these factors are likely to shape the regional markets in Asia. So over to you, Jeremy. Thanks very much, Jules. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to focus on, on three elements for my presentation, which I think should be uh, showing up shortly. Uh, the first one is consumer behavior um, and what we're seeing uh, across our markets. Um, secondly, how developers are adjusting uh, to a COVID-19 world. Uh, and thirdly, give you an overview of some of the regional themes we think will play out uh, in, in the new normal. 
So one of the great things about working in, in Southeast Asia is, is how diverse it is. Uh, and we're really seeing this diversity from our consumers uh, as they search for property during life in isolation. Uh, in terms of property searches, uh, activity has come down significantly uh, in some markets, but risen marginally in others. Uh, you know, the declines are not surprising uh, given, given the lockdowns and, and consumers are really focusing literally uh, on more bread and butter issues. Um, the number of inquirers is also varied uh, across our markets. Um, encouragingly, you know, these drops have stabilized a week after the lockdown is announced. Um, and we are currently seeing, you know, week over gro week growth of about 3% in traffic uh, and 6% in inquiries or leads, uh, which does indicate some strong underlying demand. Another key data point for us is, is China. Um, you know, we've seen a 93% increase in consumer traffic for Southeast Asian properties out, out of China. Um, you know, the Chinese have, have been very active in the Southeast Asia property market prior to COVID-19. Um, and in markets like Bangkok, they represent up to 15% of all primary or new home purchases. Um, you know, given the search volumes you know, we're seeing, uh, we do expect Chinese interest in Southeast Asia property uh, to increase from previous years. Um, and one of the key questions for developers is really you know, how they go about harnessing uh, that demand. You know, obviously another key consumer insight and something we're all going through at the moment is you know, working from home and, and life is in isolation has really further, I think, opened our eyes on how we can use technology even more in our everyday life. You know, from a property industry point of view, consumers want an immersive viewing experience from the comfort and safety of their home. Um, you know, we are accelerating our roadmap to facilitate remote viewings, virtual tours, video content. Um, while, you know, the consumer will still want to physically see the property, we do believe the number of physical viewings they do will reduce. So it's really vital um, that developers have engaging content online uh, to capture their interest. One of the, uh, yeah, this slide, thank you. One of, one of the key trends we believe COVID-19 will drive in Southeast Asia is the acceleration of developer adoption of digital uh, products. And, you know, this is not a new trend. You know, we were seeing this trend already. Uh, it's a long-term trend, but we do believe COVID-19 will accelerate it by at least one to two years. Um, we are seeing developers become much more digitally active. Uh, you know, this slide here outlines some of our initiatives, uh, but I think the key one is really the, the middle one, uh, which talks about a digital launch uh, of a project here in Singapore a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was a fairly small project, but it did result in, in 77 sales uh, over one weekend, all done digitally. Uh, so I think, you know, we don't believe physical launches will go away, uh, but we do see a world uh, where developers will launch both uh, digitally and physically simultaneously. Next, thank you. I also wanted to just quickly highlight some of the initiatives and actions we've taken uh, at Property Guru to support uh, developers. Uh, the first is FastKey, and, and FastKey is a Property Guru solution that automates the project sales cycle from launch to close of sales. Uh, we've launched FastKey Storyteller, which allows developers to create a digital show suite to enable remote viewings, which is then tied to a CRM and booking engine. Uh, this will facilitate digital project launches, which we can then display in our market leading consumer sites across Southeast Asia. We're also launching an agent marketplace in FastKey in June. Um, so projects can be marketed uh, to our 35,000 agents across Southeast Asia. Um, we spoke about demand in China. We are conducting live stream sessions with Chinese agents to connect them with developers. Uh, last week, we held a session uh, with a leading developer here in Singapore, where we had four agent, 400 Chinese agents uh, join. Again, which is a really, I think, strong reflection of underlying demand uh, in China. Um, and obviously, you know, we're conducting various outreach activities uh, like these um, with our developer partners to support them you know, with data, with insights, um, and our perspective from where we see the property ecosystem. Yeah, finally, I just wanted to summarize on, on a few of the, the key themes. The online consumer engagement remains relatively strong. Yes, it took a hit um, you know, in our markets when lockdowns were announced, uh, but is picking up strongly. You know, many markets I think, in Southeast Asia entered this pe period with a supply glut, so developers are adjusting pricing. Uh, in Singapore, uh, prices dropped one percent in Q1 and we expect prices to drop by about 8% uh, in uh, 2020. Reductions will most likely be steeper in some other markets uh, like Malaysia where the oversupply hang was a little more acute. You know consumers want the show seat experience from the comfort of their home. 
that's that's clear. You know, technology is substituting physical during these times and driving developer adoption of digital solutions across the value chain. Um, and perhaps I sort of can end on a little bit of a positive note. Um, we are starting to see some green shoots. You know, we've spoken about consumer demand uh, in China, um, but we're also starting to see demand pick up in Vietnam, uh, which relaxed their lockdown uh, and social distancing requirements earlier this week. Um, you know, we are seeing listings increase there uh, on our site, um, and some of the metrics we track really closely are up three times um, from the start of April. Um, so, I, you know, I, I'd leave you with that, uh, you know, positive uh, note about some of, um, you know, some of the early signs and those early green shoots, uh, and look forward to the Q&A session later. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Great. Um, yeah, some useful practical insights there, and, and great, great to um, hear some positive news coming out of Singapore and the region already. Thanks for that. Lloyd, are you there with us? Could, could you take I am. over? Can you hear me? We can First hear you very well. Can we do a sound check? Yep, I'm you're coming through fine for me. Same for the other speakers. Excellent. I'm seeing yes. some comments here clear, so that's good. Uh, yes. Thanks, John. So, so let's, let's move and then we'll try and come back to John in a second. Um, yeah. My background is in real estate and private equity. Um, and as a result, um, one of the things I wanted to talk to everyone about today is really kind of sort of sifting through the various issues that all of us face as we think about investing in a COVID, post-COVID environment. Um, and for the moment, I'm just sharing with you in real time how we are looking at our existing portfolio, um, our existing deployment strategy for new investments, and how we're literally assessing the market opportunity or the market um, in our own world. Uh, and I think that the five things that we're going to run through today, we feel are a good place to start, no matter where you are in the world or where you are in the kind of COVID cycle, shall we say. Um, and I think the first thing that we think is important to do in any cycle, including this, one, is to separate out real estate fundamentals from COVID specific fundamentals. And the reason is because um, in this particular downturn, we have a unique causation that is not real estate fundamentals, banking, or anything else. It's, it's biological. Um, and that, for most of us, is not before. Um, and so what we need to make sure we figure out as best we can is what we think is going to be happening with COVID, not just today, not just tomorrow, but over the medium term. And we'll get to that in a second. But we also have to remember that in the end, we're all investors and investors have to invest based on fundamentals. At least that's how we work. And as a result, you can't forget where the real estate fundamentals were not 90 days ago or 120 days ago in your particular market. And that's one of the things that we've watched certain investors lose of in the last 60 to 90 days. And suddenly they've kind of fallen back to this almost day trading mentality, which is do I get in now? Is it the dip? Are prices down? Are they up? Do I think there's going to be a J curve in the recovery? And the reality is you've got to be very careful when you lose sight of underlying fundamentals, which is how's my demand? How's my supply? What are interest rates? What do people feel is the intrinsic risk of a downturn, not related to COVID specifically, but to the fact that there are thousands, if not millions of businesses around the world that might not be here in 90 days. And we need to understand the financial and actual fundamental impact of looking at the actual economic recession itself and what that starts to look like in terms of occupational demand. Um, and so for us, looking in the UK markets, for example, and if you look at the, at some of the Asian markets, they're obviously very, very different. Tokyo office has, has got very, very low vacancy. Other markets, not so much. London happens to have very, very low office vacancy rates and the amount of supply coming online happens to be very, very low for the next four years. And now with COVID, probably looking like more like four or five or six years. And as a result, we believe that there is still good quality fundamental reasons for investing in certain asset classes like offices in the UK because they're fundamentally undersupplied. Even if you took the average, the 10 year average of demand and, and basically stayed there and knocked it back by 20%. Um, and that to us is a good place to start. Second thing to focus on is on the recovery curve, which is 
does the past hold any clues for us looking forward? Um, every recovery is different. Every downturn is different. But there are some fundamental things that are important to look for. We've covered one of them, which is what do the fundamentals look like? For those of you who are around in the late 80s or 90s in, in North America or in, in Western Europe, there was certainly a substantial amount of oversupply in the late 80s. And so as a result, the real estate recovery curve was very slow because you literally had to absorb tens of millions of square feet of empty buildings. And in fact, it got so bad, it was cheaper to tear the building down than it was to wait for it to finally get occupied four, five, six years later. Um, and so from our perspective, in looking forward, one of the things that we look for are where are interest rates? Where is unemployment? Where do we think actual occupational demand is coming from? And how does that balance against existing supply? And typically, if you look carefully at those areas, you can start to put your down a recovery curve because you understand how much real estate is actually available out there. And what do we think the demand generators are looking like um, as they start to recover through, through the recession? Uh, and so for us, that is a particularly important part of the real estate fundamental analysis. Um, the third thing that we focus on is our short, medium, and long-term priorities for capital deployment. And this is, this is much more personal to any investor, which is what are your priorities? Are you a long-term investor who's literally investing for long-term yield and, and not listen to necessarily looking for upside? Or are you looking for someone, are you looking for opportunities where you're going to be driving upside and, and moving on? Uh, repositioned assets to, to other longer term investors. Um, and I think the reason that it's particularly important now is because whenever you're investing into a downturn, through a downturn, you have to look very, very carefully at your hold period. Inevitably, things get funny when the markets get extreme. Things take longer. Sometimes they move much faster than you expect. Uh, but generally speaking, you have to be prepared to hold things longer because you know exactly how long the recovery curve is going to be. And as a result, one of the things that we focus on in our, in our priorities, in our capital deployment, is a stable capital structure. One of the things that almost always happens in a downturn is the banks freeze lending, or they make lending very, very um, favorable to the banks which means they're giving you short-term lending, they're giving you bridge financing, they're not taking the long-term risk with you. And what we found can happen to certain investors is they borrow short and they buy long. And if the recovery doesn't happen the way they think, they owe the bank the money and they haven't actually exited the asset yet or the asset hasn't actually reached maturity yet. And, and you can get caught by that kind of thing. So creating a very stable fixed rate uh, capital structure is very, very important in these very, very extreme inflection points. And speaking of inflection points, one of the things that we're already starting to see is, is the old saying of catching a falling knife, which is as the market falls, where do you put your money? Um, and we're already starting to see a flight to, to safety. And if you look throughout the uh, inquiries I suspect that you're getting in, in, uh, in Asia, it would not surprise me to find out that Singapore uh, is one of those markets that's probably getting more inquiries today than other markets which are considered emerging. Um, and the reason is because, and it's not surprising, investors are generally at this stage not looking to shoot the lights out. They're not looking for those, those um, uh, excessive returns. They're really looking to preserve capital, create yield and benefit, and not feel like they're taking undue risk in an uncertain market. Um, but what it means for those of you who are trying to identify opportunities to create more returns, it's probably not a crazy thing for the next 12 or 24 months to be looking at some of these uh, more core markets and finding opportunities where you can you know, transform the value at the asset level, where you're actually surrounded by a market that you think will have higher levels of liquidity over the near to medium term. Um, and so that really is, is the summary of how we look at the world and, and we look forward to engaging with everyone on questions shortly. I, I think John is back online. Hopefully the sound is... Would you like me to carry on? What, what please, you like do, to do? please do. Um, I will pick up. I think you can basically pick up uh, your slide again. Yeah, I'll, I'll, pick up from, I'll pick up from where I was. I, was, I, was, I, was, I, I just got to the stage of, of uh, yes, the second homes market, I think, I think should, should, be, should be strong. Retail, I think you're going to have an interesting time because the technology uh, has really changed the game. And I think what's happened is this... this um, 
a lockdown that we've had has just really accelerated that process a lot. And, and I mean, I see it here just by way of example. I mean, we get something like 400 Amazon deliveries a day here. Um, and, and everyone's just shopping online. And that's, that's going to fundamentally change things. I think retail is going to become much, much more of an experience, um, at which it was heading in anyway, and this is just going to be accelerated. And that rolls on to, which other people have said already, to offices where I think um, live, you know, live work, which was a trend 10 years ago or, or, or more, I think that people have been, have been given a full demonstration, as we are today, of all the all the opportunities and all of the advantages and disadvantages of live work. And I think that's going to become much, much more acceptable. We've all learned these words like Zoom and, and, and how to, to conference and work. And we've definitely noticed it in our office. Our level of productivity has been very good, if not better than normal in some cases. Creativity seems to be good. I don't think we should deny that there's not going to be uh, offices in the future, but clearly it, 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 it's not essential to get on a plane as often as one, as one did uh, because one can actually communicate reasonably well and, and it's incredible to see how much we've adjusted. I think the, on that side, the, uh, the depth of that change is going to be somewhat dependent upon how long this thing lasts. If this thing lasts for a long period of time, then I think the, 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 the office market might change a little bit more significantly. And again, just picking up on Lloyd's point, I think Quality is going to be a really big issue here. Quality of companies that you work with, qualities of delivery that companies can provide. Um, and, you know, there's going to be a, a flight to quality a, across the board, both in, in locations um, and, and businesses that can actually perform. Because everyone has been put in a quite a high degree of change. So our strategy is, yes, we've, Lloyd just mentioned, we've just raised the fund, which is for special opportunities in the UK. And, and that's... Um, that's in the business of repositioning, supporting other projects that might not have the capital that they need. I think it's a great time to, to get planning. Planners, planners are a lot more lenient at, at times of, of, of difficulty. Um, I think in designing and building and, uh, um, projects and placemaking projects for the future, that whole market has changed significantly. It's no longer about the, the long-term lease. It's actually about the creation of the environment at well, that, that's become much, much more important. It's also going to be a great time to build. You're going to get, you're going to get very competitive prices, I think, once, once the supply chains open up. Um, and you've also got, you know, you, you can bridge the gap by construction. So those are all the things that we're looking at. Um, apologies for the quality of the sound here. No, no problem. Thanks very much. Great insights from both of you. Thanks for your contributions. We will, I'll be back um, with a couple of questions for you at the end of the, uh, the presentations. Thank you so much. So now let's bring it back to the, the region a little uh, and, and talk to Paul Ashburn from BDO. He's going to cover some of the uh, regional fiscal policies and stimulus measures being introduced to, to re kickstart the, uh, the economies in Asia. Over to you, Paul. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, what I'll do is just give a quick snapshot of where we are in the first quarter of 2020. Um, basically, we've seen policy making around the world in overdrive. Um, there is no playbook for a pandemic in this modern era. So governments have gone um, and approved stimulus packages one, two, three times in order to respond to this deepening crisis. The result is it's had a, a very abrupt impact in, in a space of a few months on the world economy. Um, and so businesses closed down, people working from home, Paul, oh, freezing up. Sorry, mate. Paul, losing some sound. Oh, Sorry. Oh, there you are. Hmm. One thing is certain economic costs are prohibitive to continue with the lockdown. So people and the economy needs to get back to work again. On the next slide, I'm looking at the IMF's predictions for economic growth. Now, in normally around first quarter of the year, the IMF released their world economic outlook. You can imagine they needed to quickly revisit the
2021. Um, just when you're making these types of predictions, you can imagine this was just only a few weeks ago. Um, they were assuming that containment's going to peak in the second quarter and that most countries in the world will then be in recovery mode. So they're basically projecting a rebound in the second half of the year and then recovery in 2021. It's still predicted to be the worst recession since the Great Depression and far worse than the GFC in 2008. What you see though is, is Asia, and especially ASEAN, doesn't look to be as impacted as the West. So we had Asia. have Thailand, which is reporting very low numbers of new cases, and it's also now planning to come out of lockdown. Now, all these predictions are going to depend on how successful containment really is and how quickly countries can recover. And one of the assumptions here is that there are no renewed outbreaks after lockdown measures are lifted. And, and this is being raised now as a, as a serious concern whether there might be a, a second wave of what the impact will be. So there's still uncertainty, but definitely there is um, optimism that once this is contained, economies will go back into strong recovery mode. If we look at what's happening, It's just focusing to date on dealing with the issue, not with, with recovery. So in Singapore, they've got the property tax rebate of up to 100%, where that's being, that should be passed on by owners to their tenants. Australia was very quick to provide support to commercial tenants. They came out with rental moratoriums and code of conducts to follow. Turning to Indonesia, Indonesia was a bit late uh, to act, but now it's also looking to accelerate its planned tax reforms, including cutting corporate income tax. Interestingly, they're also then going to focus on the tech companies who. who which I thought was a bit ominous, given that they'd even stayed, lockdown measures hadn't even started or there was no forced business closures. So if there are going to be fire sales, real estate workouts in Thailand, then they're already providing a framework um, to incentivize that by reducing all the transfer taxes and fees. So let, let's go into the recovery and what we can expect to see second half of 2020, 2021. You can expect to see more fiscal stimulus, um, more tax relief measures in general, in the recovery phrase. Basically, countries are going to do whatever it takes to get their economy. And in Thailand, for example, they may defer the new property tax, which has already been deferred, but may have to defer it again. Overall, I think the, the incentives are going to try to stimulate um, developers to shift inventory. They're going to make real estate more affordable in this subdued market because, you know, there really is strong evidence that um, investment in housing has a strong multiplier effect for an economy overall. If we look at the industrial real estate sector. I think it's interesting to see the impact on supply chains, which have been seriously disrupted. So I think what we'll find is countries will be looking at 
um, and reviewing their self-sufficiency and goods and services. medical gloves and is the world's number one exporter of condoms who knows so I want to come in but, uh, Paul sorry we've had a few pr problems with your sound there so I, I think uh, I, I have to uh, wrap you up there because I think you, you kind of disappeared right at the end um, can you hear okay. us now yes so, I can but, hear but thank no that's fine but thank you for that that was no some good insights there um, and the slides told the story um, which is why we have a slide presentation as well as a speaking um, slot because we did lose you a few times, but I think um, the, the key core information was covered there by the slides. So like, thank you anyway for your, for your uh, contribution, very useful. Um, and now we'll move on to, uh, to Bill, who will look at some of the uh, supply dynamics across the Asia region with a, with a focus on branded residences in urban and resort destinations. So Bill, hopefully we can hear you. How are you doing? Uh, thanks, Jules. And actually, interesting enough, we we lost Paul there with condoms. That's the last thing I heard. So that was interesting. <laughs> but I'm in Phuket, so it's a sunny day outside. I've got my Ray-Bans when I walk to work today. And uh, it's a beautiful day here, though it's a lockdown. I don't know about you, but one of the best things which is going to come from this uh, COVID-19 situation when it starts ending and we start reopening things is I'm going to go get a haircut. And hopefully I'm going to get back on an airplane, which I think both myself and my wife are going to be happy about. So those are two of the out positive outcomes which we're looking as part of the reopening process. I think when we talk about, to frame my discussion today, we're gonna to be talking about hotel branded residences, but you know, let's frame ourselves looking at post COVID-19 and saying, where is real estate today? We don't have blinders on. We're not saying, we're talking about what's gonna to happen tomorrow, maybe the day after tomorrow, maybe the month after tomorrow, maybe the year after tomorrow. But at one point we're re-entering a cycle. And I think one thing that we know is certainly going back historically, and we always say this is the new normal, but is this really the new normal? We learn from cycles. You know, after 9-11, there was the fear factor, again, people getting on airplanes. America took off their shoes and it made the entire world take off their shoes. So we go back and look, and there, there became a protocol from a crisis. I think that's what we have to learn from COVID-19 saying, we're going back into a cycle and this is the start of a cycle. Now, when you cycle, you have up cycles and down cycles. When you ride a bicycle, you press down and you, you coast upwards as well. So what's gonna be happening in terms of the recycling of real estate? And something that really interested me when Jeremy spoke was, what are these positive outcomes gonna be in terms of the accelerators of the trends? You know, Where are we gonna see those green shoots? And I think typically in branded residences, whereas all type of real estates, this is an exciting space because technology certainly is gonna accelerate through the space. And I think when we look at transactions, be it COVID-19 related or anything else, people are gonna to wanna to be a hands-off approach and that's gonna accelerate technology, but not only to the point of doing views or doing, or doing part of the transaction, we think the entire transaction eventually with big data will go online. You know, we think online brokerage and having due diligence being done and title checks, and that's certainly gonna be a big outcome from this whole process because that's gonna accelerate. For the past five years, 10 years, we've talked about prop tech and what's gonna happen with that, but this is gonna be the accelerator of that. So that's gonna be one of the most exciting outcomes of this process as well. Now, if we talk about branded residences, I think branded residences are interesting for us because you know we work from Japan all the way to the Maldives with branded residences. There are branded residences in the Maldives. You know, Saniva Fushi, Saniva Johnny have sold multi-million dollar villas there. This is an interesting asset class because when we look at development appetite post global financial crisis, we saw developers globally say, we wanna break up our risk factors to developing hotels. Now today, when we look at hotels globally and ho new hotel pro projects pipeline in upscale, upper upscale and luxury, we see that probably 30 to 40% of this has a branded res residence or a mixed use element. And the reason was that we learned from the global financial crisis and that cycle is we learned that you want to break up the investment and start mitigating risk. Branded residences really provide a acceleration of returns. Typically in a hotel, it could take eight, nine, 10 years to return your capital on a hotel investment, but branded residences somehow meet the hospitality industry's you know, uh, yield expectations. I think when we look across Asia, you know, right now over a third of the global branded residences projects globally are in Asia. You know, that's a pretty high number. And that's interesting for us because, you know, it's a booming real estate market for the past few years, but 
I think what we've seen for over, you know, we can also learn what's been happening the past few years in Asia when we're saying what's going to be the future trend. Because we did see the trade war with China. We saw a slowdown for the past year, you know, in terms of certainly currency stress as well. And what that does is, is push affordable affordability into the marketplace. This has also transpired into branded residences because we're seeing smaller and cheaper. You know, in residential, there's only two things that matter. How much does it cost to build and how much can you sell it for? And so there is a lot more pressure on pricing and that's also putting pressure on sizing. So we think that's gonna flow into branded residences as well. So that's gonna be a determining factor. You know, in terms of the supply growth in Asia, it was interesting because China was an early adopter of branded residences if we go back five, 10 years. We saw a lot of projects in Southern China, especially Guangzhou and places like that where you saw big branded residences, which weren't really for rental yields. They were pretty much being driven into a hotel brand, lending their name to a real estate project. And what we saw about how China moved later on was Chinese, Chinese developers eventually said, oh, or Chinese buyers said, we want to move outside of China and put our money elsewhere. So that cooled off. But for us, mainland China is still a big market for branded residences. So there's a lot of unexplored potential in there. But typically, we're looking at Thailand has the highest number of pipeline projects, be it you know, in urban areas, Bangkok, Kuala Lumpur, Manila, Jakarta, and certainly in the resort markets when we look at Phuket and we also look at Vietnam now. Vietnam has a massive amount of condo hotel projects or condo hotel projects. You know, that's another interesting. And I think when we go back to the country profile, again, we're seeing a reasonable spread, but we're also seeing the countries whereby people are buying investment. I know Lloyd talked earlier about a, a safe flight to real estate in places like Singapore, institutional flight. And I think that's interesting from one point, but we think for branded residences, you'll see consumer or individual buyers or even smaller uh, private equity groups looking at branded residences in secondary markets because there's value there. And I think the value of that's also going to be in terms of the ongoing yields, you're not relying only on capital appreciation. The ca again, at the beginning of a cycle, capital appreciation is out the window to a point because how long is capital appreci appreciation going to take to come back? So I think that's another interesting phenomenon. I think when we talk about the brands involved and who's selling branded real estate, you know, of course, we're looking at Marriott, we're looking at it with Accor, certainly Accor at the upper level with Fairmont, Raffles, these type of projects. Uh, brands which are heavily involved in branded residence as an early adopter. We see Ducet, which is a regional group, Intercontinental with a brand stable that also includes Regent and Six Senses now. But I think one thing from our research, when we look at it, we're seeing more of a creep also now to from luxury into upscale and upper upscale. And we think that trend's going to actually continue into the mid-scale type of real estate. So if we were sitting here a year from now, we think probably the pipeline is also going to be more balanced towards upscale and upper upscale, but also starting to see more mid-scale projects because they're easier to execute. They require lower amounts of capital and they're smaller units, so they're easier to sell. So certainly that's going to be a shift in the marketplace during a period of recovery. I think certainly when we go back and look at terms of urban versus resort, we're seeing more of a balancing there. You know, traditionally resort markets were strong. If we go to North America, you know, we've learned Alpine real estate, be it Aspen, be it Vail, be it Whistler, these were projects, you know, certainly which helped define that industry. And certainly in the resort market, uh, Hawaii, you know, with condo hotels, you know, today in Hawaii, more than half the hotel supply are condominium hotels. When we look about this, this, uh, you know, people ask me, well, how stable is this sector? You know, we have to go back to Hawaii where they started selling in the 1960s condo hotels. And, you know, some 60 years later, we're still seeing that as a driving force of the accommodation market. But one thing that's different for hotel branded residents is when you're selling rentals versus full-time residences is it's an indication of the hotel market. And that's often when we look at uh, guaranteed yields and projects like that saying, is it real or not? It's going to be based on a hotel market, not a real estate dynamic. And that's kind of a different mindset with branded residences. I think certainly in terms of room types, again, and type of units which people are buying, two bedroom, again, you know, this is kind of a foot in both ways. Traditionally, we would say people would be buying larger luxury units but, and, and also the smaller units just for a yield. But now we're seeing a foot in both saying, well, let's kind of leverage this. And it's a little real estate and also it's a little yield base. So a two bedroom unit across the board in all the markets we look at is by far the most popular type of unit. And I think, again, when we go back into the Asia style of branded residences, and look at the broader market. We recently looked at what the branding premium was. And traditionally, a hotel group will say it's 
But interesting, in Asia, that's pretty much holding true when we go to places like the Seco with the Park Hyatt and other markets. I think we are seeing more pressure in North America, in Europe as well, where you have other luxury developers without brands attached to it, which are creeping in. So we're seeing those premiums slip a little bit in other markets. But Asia, for the most part, we're seeing 20 to 30% branded premiums. I think that's all for me now, Jules. Do you want to move on? Great. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Nice. Yeah, so your, your sound was perfect, which was great. Um, I think, you know, some sorry. great regional was that condom? insights. Condom, you said? No, sorry. No, 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 that was, that was. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, <Sorry>. Bill. <laughs> yeah, classic, he always has these. Uh, yeah, so, so Bill's giving us a bit, of, yeah, a bit of regional perspective there on some of the product classes as well. I think um, before we go to the uh, participant questions, I think I'd like to dive a little deeper into some of the key points that we've raised in the presentations. Uh, and just throw a few questions at you guys um, to elaborate a little. If we could start with John, because um, you're, you're, you're back on and your, your sound is clear as a bell, I believe now. Although you may still be on mute, there you go. Uh, yeah, John, uh, yeah. So as a developer, you know, a, a core, at the core of your business, I mean, you do many other things, but as a developer, uh, what does your instinct tell you? I mean, there, there, there are a lot of different asset classes, um, markets to look at, different options. And what, what does your instinct tell you in terms of where to invest as, as the countries start to flatten the curve and we, we see a, a recovery? I mean, this is, this is I, I, counted, I counted five recessions in my, um, in my career in, in property. And this is a very interesting one because, you know, the crystal ball is very murky because it, you, you're opening your doors on day two and then just trying to see what's going on. The... I mean, clearly, we, we, we've outlined in, in some of the talks and everyone has in, in their, their feeling for what's going to happen. I think the, it's going to be very much consumer-led and it's going to be very much dependent upon how uh, governments manage that um, and, how they, and how they manage the behaviour of people and, uh, with, with their various stimulus packages. So it's not, it's not clear. I think, the, I think there will certainly be opportunities where you have very highly leveraged companies that don't have solutions that uh, are short of cash. I think those, those are situations that we could definitely see. I think there will be um, <clears throat> you know, repositioning, rethought out projects. Uh, and I, we are, I mean, I, I, I think it would be foolish for anyone to expect the lights just to be turned back on immediately. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be, it's going to be a slow climb. Um, you know, I'm with Bill I, I, on, on, on the branded element, which is the, the, the flight to quality. I think people will be looking for, you know, the companies that people have heard of to, to, to go out and buy. Um, the, the advantage of, of the sort of condominium hotels is that you can both rent them and, and, and use them, which is nice. But there, are, there will certainly be there'll certainly be lots to do. I mean, that, that's that's for sure. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, John. And Lloyd, to follow on from that, I mean, we talk about quality, and you, and you also mentioned the flight to safety, um, presumably more from an institutional investment point of view. But what what constitutes safety in a in a post COVID uh, economy? I mean, <laughs> you know, is it based on on history and? Yeah. Look, I think I think we have to separate the biology from real estate fundamentals. So we have talked a little bit about the biology, and I think it's probably worth touching on a little bit more now. The, the simple fact is we're in an unprecedented environment where no one on this call, I'm going to presume, is an epidemiologist who can actually chart the curve of what this is going to look like in terms of recovery, in terms of the chances that we get a cure. Um, and so as a result, there are some fundamental unknowns that we're faced with, which you normally do not have in an economically driven recession. Um, and so I think when we talk about um, flight to safety um, in that kind of an environment, it is, as John says, a little bit murky. Um, however, if you take kind of the wider path in the middle ground, which is looking back at 1918, looking back um, at multiple different times, whether it was war, pestilence, famine, uh, or other forms of disease, the world has found a way to recover and move on. Um, and I, I hate to say it, but I think from, from just speaking for myself and the people that I, I know in and around me, there's very few of us who actually were that familiar with the pandemic of 1918. But if you do the arithmetic, it is staggering that in the next six months, 
for us in this planet to come anywhere close to what happened in 1918, I think the number is some 70 to 200 million people would have to die by December. That is a staggering statistic um, when you compare what happened 100 and some odd years ago. But the reality is the world moved on and it moved on where people were still gathering and doing all manner of things until actually this generation forgot. Um, so on the assumption that we do find a path through this in the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, then we are back to looking at economic fundamentals, in which case the flight to safety is going to be driven by fundamental investment um, rules that have applied for generations, and as John says, for multiple, multiple cycles, which is what is the quality of my location? What is the quality of my offer? Am I a branded residence or an unbranded residence? Do I actually have the physical attributes of what occupiers are looking for in hotels, senior healthcare, retail? Um, and I think if you are applying those fundamentals and looking for high quality developments, well-conceived projects in good locations with low supply and a historically fundamentally strong demand base, that is what we would consider to be a very good starting point for flight to quality. Great, thank you. Thanks very much, Lloyd. And that brings us back to Bill in many ways here. I mean, you, you talk about the quality side of things, the, the safety of the brand, et cetera. But there is the question that's attached to that, that we're talking essentially about hotel brands. And this is one of the, uh, the worst hit um, sectors at, as we're looking at it at the moment globally is travel and hotels. So presumably the branded residence side of things will rely on a return to strength in the hotel sector quite heavily, which uh, presumably you predict will happen. To a part and parcel, but I mean, at the end of the day, hotel companies in Asia, at least, which is you know, the subject today, they're becoming more focused on scaling their projects, but also they're looking at, you know, the ultimate impact of COVID-19 on hotel companies is they're going to be downsizing staff and they're going to be focusing on what their income earners are. And the licensing revenue of branded residences is quite high while the distribute, while the, while the, uh, versus a hotel operation. So Mia plays into that scenario very easily because Ultimately, hotel companies, in my view, when you look at companies like Accor, they're looking at becoming distribution companies. They're looking at licensing companies. They're looking to franchise their name. So to me, this is a, go this is a strong opportunity for the hotel companies to actually start licensing these branded real estate opportunities as well. And just one more thing. Today, we didn't talk much about, it's going to say, what are the quality locations or anything else? But my question is, what is the new quality? You, you know. Are, are our values post COVID-19 for a person buying property going to change? Are they going to say, is the new luxury having space to be escapism? Is it going to be to having more space? Do I want a bigger house where I work from home? What is the new real estate? I think that's going to be also what you really have to look forward to. What are the trends today in real estate in terms of what the new luxury or what the new trends are going to be? And Lloyd, you're really dark. And in, in case of the next COVID emergency, I've got my alarm here as well. So if you hear that, cover your ass and run away. <laughs> um, Jules, could, 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 I, could I quickly ask a question related to that? I think it's very interesting, um, uh, Bill, talking about um, location. If you've got one from, from, from the participants, please go ahead. Yeah. Ab absolutely. Um, just about location. So Sphere Estates, they're saying they're having a surge in interest in, uh, in remote locations. Um, will the, these locations outperform the traditional branded residences? Remote locations. Like Phuket, Bill, where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe over to John Hitchcock. They've got a lot more experience. He's, he can't even get Wi-Fi. I, I mean, John, you, what do you think? If you want me to have a go at that, I, I, think, yes. I, mean, I think that's that's the sort of micro market there you're talking about. We're, I mean, if, you no. know, the one-off person who wants to go and live in outside Wales or in far <laughs> north uh, New Zealand or somewhere, I, that's certainly, you know, you saw that after the last, um, you know, the, the issues in 2007 and uh, it's certainly it is a micro pocket I think the um, I was you know I, I think the idea of people will be looking at second homes now they're looking at, we're looking at second homes that they can get to in an environment like this what that quantity is I don't know and I think it's going to be interesting to see when the lights go back on um, so yes I, I mean I think there is probably a distinction here Bill between 
hotel and branded residences. I think branded residences will get support because uh, it, it being in rentals or, or or in sales because there is a sort of a quality statement that's on that's right. on on the door. Hotels, it, 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 uh, the reality is, I think we we're gonna we're gonna have to wait and see how quickly things go come back to normal because of you know we're talking today about the, the being extended lockdown in the UK and and then I look today South Korea's got no no new cases so we just we're, I think that's going to be a wait and see game but it's certainly I don't I don't think people's habits of tra around travel are going to significantly change over the long term uh, back to Lloyd's points really okay great thank you thank you Joe um I think Paul are you still with us uh, I think you changed your connection didn't you yeah I'm here you, Jules yeah no just just wanted to say I mean as it gets competitive uh, you're talking about the fiscal policies and the incentives I mean are there winners and losers in terms of entire nations here that will be attracting more investment than others because of the incentives they're offering? Or is it pretty much across the board quite similar, do you think? I, I think the, the point I was raising was that there's gonna be a recovery. Um, you think the consumer behavior is going to change? I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment. So there could be subdued demand uh, in the real estate market. And I think that you know, when you look at housing activity, it has a great multiplier effect in the economy. So as a policy, um, it is something you want to promote is uh, the housing industry. So we, we could see that leading some of the recovery. Um, and then I've also just pointed out that in, especially in Asia, there is restrictions on, on foreign ownership. Um, mm -hmm landed property, condominiums. And you saw before in Bangkok that uh, foreigners buying condominium units in Bangkok, large percentage of those were Chinese. So I think they will want to attract the Chinese investment back. But one of the issues at the moment will be about, you know, the, the uh, is traveling, uh, restrictions on, on border movements. So I, I'm interested to see if they might also ease up on the uh, restrictions on foreign ownership. It may be just for a short period, but to, but to do enough to, to stimulate uh, interest in the housing market to help the, uh, the economy overall uh, to recover. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, I'd like to go quickly back to Jeremy. We haven't seen him since the beginning. Uh, maybe shift the focus a little bit uh, as, as we wrap up here. I mean, we, we haven't really spoken out about, about the, uh, the feel good side, i.e. You know, some of the, the property companies we've been reporting on developers have been doing significant things to help out in the community, help their employees. Do you think that's also a significant new trend that will continue post COVID? Is that important to the real estate industry or is it just a yeah, reaction? I, no, I think, I think it's, uh, it's really important. I think if anything, you know, the, the sense of community um, is gonna become even, even stronger. So, I, so I'd expect that within the real estate industry um, to be a trend that sort of survives post COVID-19. I mean, certainly for us, you know, it's something we've been very focused on as a company, you know, really, you know, um, you know, working with our employees through these difficult times, but also our customers. Um, and, you know, we work with, you know, 40,000 agents uh, across uh, Southeast Asia. And, you know, for us, it's been really important to show uh, our partnership um, to those agents because these are very, very difficult times uh, for them. So, you know, we've sort of, you know, uh, launched a suite of relief initiatives worth over $2 million um, you know, in our markets to sort of support agents and really partner with them through these difficult times. And I think, you know, when the chips are down, um, you know, when people are there, um, you know, you, they remember, right? And they remember that you're there for them. Um, and you can really sort of build a lot of sort of, um, you know, lifetime value um, and really build a solid relationship and partnership uh, moving forward. I think, you know, these are really important initiatives um, and focus areas that will survive post COVID-19. Okay, thanks, Jerry, thanks. Well, we're, we're almost up for the, for the hour, but I think, David, you might have one more from our uh, participants to, to, to throw and sometimes specific thanks. or everyone. Thank, 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 thanks, Jules. Yes, um, it's uh, um, a lot, a lot of, uh, it's come up a lot um, in the Q&A actually. Um, will the countries that have responded quickest and fastest and best post COVID, the recovered quickest like Vietnam, shall we say, like South Korea, like China, will there be more investment into their property markets as a result of their, uh, their, their speed of recovery? Who wants to Anyone take that? Yeah, who wants to take that? <laughs> I think I have a dash at that. I mean, <laughs> the 
the early returns is exactly like tourism. It's going to be domestic housing. So you have to look at which markets are going to, you're going to see domestic. So when you're betting on, on, on which countries are going to see a return of domestic housing demand, I think that plays into places like Vietnam in terms of, you know, which countries are opening quicker and which countries is there still demand moving forwards. We think those countries will be, be, be fast adopters. I was in Asia during SARS. I was in Asia at 1997, and we certainly see these type of uh, uh, early adopter countries move quicker than the West, you know, in terms of that. So I think we, we would pinpoint that there's still going to be a lot of pain in Hong Kong. There's still going to be a lot of pain in Singapore. You know, we'd see these emerging economies as on a, on a consumer basis for consumer real estate, faster recoveries. Mm. Jeremy, I saw you yeah. put your hand up. Do you, do yeah, you agree? No, I, was, I was trying to be very polite there, Jules. Um, no, I agree. I, agree with Bill, right? I was actually going to mention, you know, Vietnam as well. I mean, I think, you know, Bill, you know a little bit, you know, what Lloyd's Lloyd been talking about, about fundamentals. Um, you know, I also think about, you know, what was a good idea pre-COVID is, is probably still a good idea post-COVID. I think you know, there are changes, um, but Vietnam just fundamentally very strong. I mean, it was, you know, forecasted to grow at 7%, you know, it's still forecasted even post-COVID to grow at 5%. You know, so I think Vietnam will be really sort of uh, uh, lead the sort of, lead the region out of this. Great, thank you. I think overall, overall, um, uh, the point here is, is, is housing. I mean, I think housing is certainly, you know, people still need somewhere to live and they're probably more focused on their homes than they ever have been. Uh, and I think governments will be uh, looking to stimulate the construction sector and particularly across the planet that there is a, a shortage of homes. So that's certainly a, an area that you could see that would get a, a, a potentially get a lot of stimulus. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we, we are on time. Uh, it's, it's an hour. We've, we've gone through here now. So very interesting insights there from everybody on the panel and Huge thanks for you to, to join this first Asia Real Estate Summit live webinar. Thank you to John um, and Lloyd from you for joining us internationally from across the planet. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy from Singapore, thanks a lot for, for contributing. David Johnson on the, on the, uh, in the questions, thank you. <laughs> and Paul Ashburn in Bangkok, thanks for joining us. And of course, we can't forget Bill, who's already for, ready for a big farewell, I think. Yeah. Bill? One, Sonny Phuket. Sonny Phuket. <laughs> Sonny Phuket from Bill. So we, we look forward to, uh, and thank you, obviously, to all our participants here. It was going up and down between four, five, six hundred people. Uh, so great participation. Thank you very much. We have received a lot of questions. We will endeavor to answer them via uh, email if you send us inquiries through the system. And we do look forward to welcoming you back for more webinar sessions over the next few months as we invite more global experts to share their thoughts on everything from architecture and design to future-proof development strategies, smart investments, and other strategies in the new normal. So in the meantime, stay connected to the Property Guru Asia Real Estate Summit uh, on our social media channels, and we'll see you again online soon. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, guys. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.